Hey there, whether you're a part of our church family or a friend tuning in, we love that you are here and pray that you might hear from God today. It is our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from these resources, we ask that they are only supplemental and no way replace a commitment to a gathering and learning within a local church. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but are never meant to replace our belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove and what we're up to, head to cglife.org and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, just simply email info at cglife.org. Now, we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Hey, good morning, Center Grove. So glad to be here. Happy New Year. (laughs) So what a wonderful day just to start off our new year together, to lift high the name of Jesus, to proclaim that He alone is worthy, He alone is great. If this is your first time joining us, what a great time to visit. (laughs) We're so glad that you're here. And if you're joining us online or if you're part of our CG family worshiping with us online, welcome. We're glad that you're able to join us that way as well. Before we get started today, before we sing, I want just God's word to call us to worship. Uh, In Psalm 95, the psalmist, he, he reminds us, he shows us what we are to do when we enter this place. And it's not circumstantial, but it's It's who we are as believers. It's the foundation of because of Christ, we can do this. The psalmist says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Man, that's true of our God. And I invite you to stand. Let's do that together. We won't be quiet. 
power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great Majestic than our eyes could even imagine or fathom or capture. So God, today we ask that you would capture our hearts because there's nothing better than walking into a year together declaring that you alone are above it all, that you alone are greater, that you alone can sustain us through all that this life has to, to offer because we know that this is not the end of life, that through Jesus, there's so much more. So help us to see, help us to remember, help us to rest 
in the finished work of Jesus that, so that we might live faithful, so that we might live dependent on you, our great God. We love you. We lift high your name. Be with us as your word is open. May we hear from your spirit. Amen. You can take a seat. Happy New Year. Good morning. I see the uh, glow of a new year on all of your faces today, and it really encourages me. So thanks for bringing your glow with you. My name is Seth Brown. I'm one of the pastors here at Center Grove. I've said this the last couple times, but um, I think I'll probably say it a couple more times after this. I'm still the new guy around here, so you still have to show me grace and give me the benefit of the doubt, especially if I say something crazy today after... Christmas and New Year when you're all, when, and when you, for some reason after a rest, you kind of need another rest sometimes it seems like, but nevertheless, I'm excited to be here with you today. Take your Bibles and uh, turn with me to Psalm 127, Psalm 127. So just go to the middle of your Bible, take a left until you get to Psalm 127. And uh, before, uh, before we dive into deeply, let me just say we're, we're in January now, January, 2022, and there's, there's actually quite a bit going on here at Center Grove in the month of January. So make sure you're checking your emails, make sure that you're, that you're checking the website because we got a lot of stuff happening. We have volunteer trainings, we have a starting point at the end of the month and a lot of things in between, things kicking back off. So just make sure that uh, you're ready to run with us. And uh, as I say that, uh, it, it is a little ironic looking at the text we're gonna to read today. As I say, we have a lot going on and get ready to run with us because in many ways, what we're gonna look at today is the idea of how do, we, how do we pace our lives in such a way where God is actually involved in every area of our life and we don't leave him behind. And I think that's a really important thing that we need to look at, not only heading into a new year, but really any time. So before I get too ahead of myself, I'll, I'll stop myself there. And uh, by way of in introduction, let me just kind of expose myself a little bit more. I've said this before, but I'm a little bit of a history nerd. I don't know extensive knowledge about history. So if you know a bunch of history and you want to take me to lunch and uh, tell me about your specific area of interest, let's nerd out together. I'm here. Um, even if you're online watching, you know, just let me know. We're going to do this. We can do it. And so I was, uh, I was reading a book earlier in the week. It's not a history book, but it, it shared this illustration that I thought was, was really interesting and actually pretty pertinent to us. And so it didn't tell the year, it didn't tell a lot of specifics. It was really just this story that had a purpose. And so I'll leave out some of the stuff that, uh, that, that are that specific that could get us lost in the weeds. But um, sometime in the 1800s, there's this, this group of people that was traveling west from St. Louis to Oregon. And they were followers of Jesus. And as they were traveling west, and you know, if you're a, Millennial, if you're born in the 90s, just think like wagon, Oregon Trail. Remember? Does anybody remember Oregon Trail? I, I didn't make it very far. It was always typhoid or something that'd get me. But, um, anyways, in this story, this group of uh, this group of Christ followers traveling from St. Louis to Oregon, and what they did for most of their travels is each week they would actually practice a 24-hour Sabbath. So before you think. Um, we're, we're going to talk about something and, and be overly legalistic about the Sabbath. That's not really where we're going. Essentially what they would do is they would take a day, they would rest and they would remember God. I mean, that's pretty much the simplest way to define the Sabbath is you rest and you remember God. And they would do that for most of their journey. And then what happened was winter was kind of creeping up on them and they weren't where, they weren't in Oregon yet. They weren't where they were, were heading to. And so some of the group started to get a little restless thinking, you know what? We are not gonna make it to Oregon before winter. We need to stop Sabbathing and we need to press on. And there's a disagreement that arose in the group. And so what happened basically was this group of travelers ended up splitting up in two groups. One decided to press on and they stopped, they stopped stopping for a 24 hour Sabbath. And the other group decided we're gonna keep doing what we've been doing. 
We're going to stop once a week, remember God, and we're going to rest. Here's the question. You actually, I want you to answer this. Which group do you think made it to Oregon first? The one that practiced the Sabbath, that stopped. And there's practical reasons and there's, of course, some spiritual reasons to that. I think, practically speaking, God has designed the earth in such a way that when you, when you, do, when you basically go along with God's design of the world and you incorporate time in your life to rest and reflect and to keep God at the center of all you do, you actually function at your best. You're more effective. You're more rested. You're more joyful. I think we've all experienced that. When you have time to really stop and reflect and rest, you're simply more joyful. You look and act a lot more like Jesus. So the group that stopped in Sabbath, it wasn't like God was, uh, it's not like God was punishing this one group for not Sabbathing and just decided to bless this other group for Sabbathing. Actually what happened is God designed us to keep him in the center of all we do. And when we do that, we function at our best. So they ended up making it to Oregon first. And for us in this room, not just heading into a new year, but truthfully, every day, every week of our lives, we need to stop and remember when God is at the center of all that we do, we function at our best. But if you're like me, let's do some confession time here. If you're like me, you probably have a tendency to compartmentalize your life. You have a a part of your life for, for work, You have a part of your life for friends. You have a part of your life for your faith. And sometimes life with God does not pour over into these other areas of your life. And you might act differently in one area than you do another. I remember in in college, we, uh, we were part of a college ministry, which was a really, really, it was a really, really neat experience where you had these 20 something year olds who each week we legitimately cared enough about each other to ask, how are you doing spiritually? Are you still struggling with this? Are you still wrestling with this? Are you reading, like, are you reading your Bible? Are you praying every day? And, I, and the thing that was great about it was the accountability. But the thing that I also realized was there, there were many of us, including me, who would read our Bible in the morning. And as soon as we started heading to class, it's like our brains would switch off. And it's like the thing that we just read was really not impacting the rest of our day. Not that we were doing anything like crazy on campus. We weren't like, like street preachers, like condemning people or anything. It was just, you didn't sense that, you didn't sense the presence of God throughout your day. It was like you had your quiet time and you'd move on and God's presence evaporated pretty soon after. And I've learned that there's actually, there's actually a better way. There's a way that you can live your life with God in all of life. So that's really the big idea. We're gonna read our Psalm, but let me give you the big idea first. Today, what we're gonna do is is really what I wanna argue. I wanna argue that you were created to experience true meaning and rest in your life by living life with God in all of life. Life with God in all of life. That is what you were created for. That is so much easier to understand than it is to apply, let me just add. And I'm saying that as a pastor. So let's read our Psalm, Psalm 127. And we'll look at, we'll take a deeper look at what this means really to live life with God in all of life. Psalm 127, one, it says this. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate." Man, there's, there's a lot here that we're not gonna be able to cover, but what I, what I will say is this is a Psalm that for about four years has been kind of a, a go-to for me personally. Um, I, I kind of have a high-strung personality. I, uh, I, I can fall into just kind of anxious toiling pretty easily. And some of you in here, if you're type A, you probably have that same disposition. And so Psalm 127 has been a reminder for me over the years that 
unless God is involved in what I'm doing, what I'm doing ultimately is vain. Sometimes we might be doing things that we think include God, but they really are more about ourselves. And I know that's been true of me and I'm confident that's probably true of some people in this room. But as we, uh, I think it's appropriate to even read this Psalm because the context of this Psalm is really, is actually kind of interesting. You know, Psalms were not written just for coffee mugs and Hobby Lobby signs. Psalms had a much deeper purpose than that in their original context. And for a lot of Psalms, we don't really know the specific reason why they were written. Sometimes it was just a personal Psalm that shows this one person at this one time dealing with this one issue. But this Psalm is actually one of two Psalms written by Solomon and it's called a Psalm of Ascents. And basically what that means is that the, the, the Jewish people would take these pilgrimages to Jerusalem to celebrate these certain feasts and holidays. And they would read these Psalms on their way up to Jerusalem. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know if you have these traditions that you did in the car when you do road trips. Ours weren't as holy as reading Psalms. Ours was like playing I Spy and Katie and I do a really weird one. But I think because I want you to know me and I'd like to know you, I'll just tell you a little bit. Katie and I will try to uh, see who can see roadkill first and we have different points assigned (laughs) to different animals. You know, more rare animals are worth more points. And so if you point at it and say, I see it, you get a certain number of points. And if you accidentally point at a blown out tire, then uh, that's actually negative points. So um, if you need a new tradition, God bless you. 2022, here you go. But the Jewish people would read these Psalms preparing their hearts. Basically they would stop and remember God as they went to remember him even more by celebrating a feast in Jerusalem. And do you realize that you know, you're not all that much different than the ancient Israelites. You need times to stop and remember God. You need times that are set aside where your your work, your relationships, all your priorities, they're still there, but you set them aside to devote some attention to Jesus, to, to devote some attention to God. And so they would read these Psalms to prepare their hearts to celebrate him. And so that's what they're doing and that's kind of what we're doing is we're, we're trying to stop and ask the question. Here's what I want you to ask. What areas of my life am I leaving God out of? What areas of my life am I leaving God out of? And before you go off and start feeling guilty, pastors do this too. Just because you work at a church doesn't mean that God is always involved in all that you're doing. It's really a tricky thing, our intentions and our motives. And sometimes we think we have good motives and we might not. And God being gracious and good, knowing everything about you, knowing your whole heart still calls you to himself in all your brokenness and all your weariness and all your sin. And he says, come to me and let me come to you. Let me be involved in your life. So that's the question. In what areas of your life is God left out of? So let's read back through verse one. And we're gonna look at the ingredients to living a meaningful life. The ingredients to living life with God in all of life. And verse one is simple. And it says this, unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So let me make some observations that are, I, they're, they're kind of obvious if you're looking for them, but sometimes we're, they're overlooked. And uh, the two observations are this, there's two people involved in verse one, two actors. There's you and there's God. You know, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So there's two people involved. And then there's also, there's two activities. You see building and then you see watching or protecting. And so I want you to think building is the idea of, it's not just building a house because if if God called all of us to build a house, I'd build some pretty bad houses, just to be honest. I can barely build a child's house, a little playhouse. Building is the idea of cultivating. What are you cultivating in your life? What work has God assigned to you? And it doesn't have to be, sometimes we over-spiritualize our work. 
and we think that our, there's a difference between the work that you do to get a paycheck and then like your spiritual work, but actually God wants to kind of put those together. You know, he wants to mold those together. That's another sermon for another day, but you got what you cultivate and then you have what you protect. So there's two actors, you and God, and then there's two activities. There's building and protecting. And the ingredients to a meaningful life is pretty simple. Is God involved in the things you cultivate? Is God involved in the things that you're protecting? A meaningful life involves God. But here's something that kind of, that strikes me as I think about this is if you look at the life of somebody who has God involved in their life compared to the life of somebody who does not, sometimes their lives look really, really similar. And the reason I point that out is because don't just assume God is involved in what you're doing. You need to really take some time to reflect on it. Is he involved in everything I'm doing? Is God involved in all of life? That's the key difference between a life that has meaning and a life that ultimately is vain as Solomon writes here. And you know, this, this really, what this does is it, it brings us back to an example that's the most important example in the entire Bible. That's Genesis one through three. A lot of you are about to start or just did start a Bible reading plan. Who did start a, a new Bible reading plan? You started in Genesis one, like today or yesterday. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, if you go to centergrovechurch.com, then we'll have some reading plans for you available. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding, but there's gonna be many people. Maybe you're just slow to start. <laughs> Because it's January 2nd now. You don't want to get too far behind. When you start your Bible reading plans, oftentimes you're starting, you know, Genesis 1, Genesis, and you, you read probably the most important three chapters in the whole Bible. Because the first three chapters of the Bible, they hold the key to interpreting the entire Bible well. It has every single important theme that you see throughout the rest of the scriptures can be found in Genesis one through three. It's really, really important. And if you think about, think about the story of Adam and Eve and the temptation they faced to take from the tree, God said, I have given you everything you need. I've made everything that's good. There's only one thing. Just trust me for wisdom and don't go and take from the tree and try to get wisdom yourself and define it in your own way. Just trust me for wisdom. Trust me to tell you what's good and what's bad and don't try to define it for yourself. That's really the essence of taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the serpent comes and tempts Eve and basically what he says is, hey Eve, guess what? Um, you could be God, he just doesn't want you to be God and you don't really need God. And you must realize that the temptations you face are no different than, than the belief of those two lies. Every single day, you are called and beckoned to say, I can be God and I do not need God. Some of us don't feel like we're tempted in that way, but every time we put our own needs above somebody else's, we're saying, I'm God. What I need matters more. Every time we act in a way where we're, we're simply self-sufficient and we feel like what we're doing does not require the love and the life of Jesus. And what we're saying is we don't need God. Every temptation you face comes down to believing those two things. I, I could be God and I don't need God. It's the epitome of every spiritual problem we've all ever had. And so as we think about this new year, just realize that's, that's our temptation. You know, I think about like, I think about my kids, toddler age, you know, there is a sense where God gives humanity healthy autonomy. You know, you should be able to make decisions to cultivate. God doesn't just say, be a robot and just do everything I say. And that's it. He actually says, I've given you this creative autonomy to build and cultivate. I just want to do it with you. And I want you to look to me as the author of wisdom. That's really what God is saying. So like my toddler's they want a healthy amount of autonomy. 
but they also want a very unhealthy amount of autonomy. You know, when they like want to drive my car, then that's when I say, you know what, maybe it's better if I drive the car. <laughs> and my girls, what they do is, I actually like it when they start growing in autonomy. You know, now they do this thing, trial and error, where they want to get their own glass of water. So they get their cup of water. The fridge has the little water thing on it. They are, their, their head is right here and the water thing is right there. And they just basically blindly stick their water cup up there. <laughs> and fill it up. Takes a lot for a type A person that doesn't like a big mess. God has been working on me with water spots all over the floor all the time. (laughs) But I actually like that they want this type of autonomy and God wants you to work towards that type of autonomy, but he doesn't want you to define good and evil on your own without him. He doesn't want you to live as if he's simply an add on. He wants you to Trust his love and his presence as the greatest treasure. So you've got to understand that the temptations that you face every single day is the temptation to self-sufficiency, the temptation to say, I am God and I don't need God. That's the greatest temptation. You know, the word sin, if you do a word study on it, the, the word sin it's, uh, it's been used so much that sometimes it's lost. It's like punch, but it literally means missing the mark. And if you think about it, the essence of sin is missing the mark for which you were created to live life with God. Because every time you embrace sin, you're embracing something that's less than human because God created you to be fully human. And as we head into this new year, we got to... Re- Let's, let's let God be God and let's acknowledge our need for him and not, not fall to the call to be our own God and to make our own way. And you know, verse two actually is, if you read it, which we will, verse two echoes really the result of the curse of Genesis three. You know, if you remember Genesis one through three, Adam and Eve eat of the fruit They basically say they don't need God. We can define good and evil on our own. And then God says, you know what? Work is gonna become toilsome and hard when it was supposed to be good and life-giving. Work is gonna be hard. It's gonna produce anxiety. It's gonna produce vexation when I created you for healthy cultivation. And then we read verse two, which says this, it is in vain that you rise up early and go lay to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. When I read verse two, I'm really surprised by the last word here. Fill in the blank. The Lord gives his beloved early retirement. A car that runs and we can trust it. No, it says the Lord gives his beloved, those he loves. What? Say it with me. Sleep. Have you ever robbed your sleep to pay for your cares? I have. I think I have this week, actually. Every time you fall asleep, it's a reminder that God loves you. Every time you work trusting God's provision, it's a reminder that God loves you and and desires to take care of you. And you know, I'm going to use the example of the Garden of Eden a lot here because ultimately what it comes down to is when you try to define good and evil on your own, it's a, it's a forgetting that God loves you. It's a forgetting that God has your best in mind. Every time we eat the bread of anxious toil, it's a refusal to remember that God loves you, that you are the object of his affection. It's really easy to, to, to remember that God loves you when you're doing well. It's a lot harder to remember that God loves you when you're anxious and fearful and tired. Isn't it? You know, you almost feel like, all right, I'm stressed out. I'm fearful. I'm anxious. I'm kind of tense. So once I get that sorted out, I can kind of, 
I'll go back to doing the spiritual things and I'll remember that God loves me. But actually God loves you as you are even in that moment as a Christ follower. So verse two is telling us, it's, it's, what it's saying is pretty plain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Think about it, another, another parent illustration here. Um, my kids are still at the age where they will like wake up at night. Katie and I have to take shifts, you know, where the watchman watching the city, so to speak, except it's really a monitor that screams at us whenever a kid cries. And uh, Claire, our youngest, woke up last night, um, but I don't have a cool story for that other than she was hungry. But Sophie, our middle child, who doesn't usually wake up, but she's turning three in two weeks. So at three years old, they start to have nightmares and things like that. And uh, she, she woke up crying earlier this week and uh, dad was on duty. So I went in the room uh, half asleep and she was crying. And I was like, Sophie, what's wrong? And she says, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> and I said, I just got in here. And then she said, oh. And then she went back to sleep. <laughs> so I don't know what kind of dream she was having. She never told me about it, but it uh, must, must not have been a good one. But when I went in there, I had every intention to do whatever it took to help her go back to sleep. Because she functions at her best when she's rested. And I love her. God loves you. Go to sleep and remember his love. Rest and remember his love. Because he loves you. Now we'll say this illustration falls apart because 20 minutes later, Sophie was crying again because my comfort wasn't, my love apparently wasn't comforting enough. So mommy's love worked the second time and she fell back asleep. But in, every time you go to sleep, remind yourself, the fact that I'm laying in bed about to fall asleep is God telling me he loves me. He loves me. This is the invitation that Jesus gives us too in Matthew chapter 11, when one of the most profound things that he ever said, when he calls us to himself and he says, come to me all who weary and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. So what Jesus tells us to do is he says, you know what? I'm a poor guy, but I have an invitation for you. And it's not for more things. It's not for more power possessions or popularity. It's an invitation to live your life with God, to incorporate God into everything that you're doing, even in your rest. Guys, for some reason in our, in our Christian tradition, we sometimes think God is blessed by our overwork and our overconfidence. And that's quite the opposite of the truth. God is blessed by your worshipful rest You work hard when it's time to work, but you rest when it's time to rest. And that's ultimately the path that God calls us to, to live life with God in all of life, to invite him in to all that you're doing. And the way that you invite him in to your life, well, we'll get to that in a second. I don't want to spoil it. Let's read verses three through five so I can move a little quicker and give you this last example, because at first glance, verses three through five don't seem to really fit here. It's like, a hard right turn, but actually this is a really genius example. But it says this, verse three, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. So verse one, you got the ingredients to a meaningful life. It's basically... You're somebody who builds, who cultivates, and you do it with God. Verse two is like these two outcomes. You can either be a burdened, anxious worker or a restful worshiper. Those are the two outcomes. And then verses three through five 
give us this unlikely example of how God works in our normal lives, how he builds with us, and how he takes care of us. It's a, actually a running illustration of the first two verses, and it actually it doesn't make a lot of sense in 21st century culture, but in ancient Israel, Israeli culture, this actually makes a lot of sense. Essentially, what, what's happening here is that the gate is the, the gate of the city is where business transactions or war negotiations would take place. And so picture the Psalm 127 man, this ancient Israelite who had a lot of kids young and he saw those things as a blessing from God, not a thorn in his side. And through the tough years, him and his wife raised the children into adulthood. And now as an older man, this Psalm 127 man is negotiating either a business deal or a war negotiation at the gate. And who's behind him? His kids. And if you're an archer, what, what sits on your back? A quiver with arrows in it. So you see this picture of the Psalm 127 man entering into a negotiation and behind him is his quiver full of children who are there legitimately and practically to get his back as he negotiates this deal. So the surprising thing about this is God in very natural ways builds a house with you and protects you. He did so for this Psalm 127 man through children, through the raising of a family. It's just an example of the first two verses in action is all it is. And the thing I wanna point out guys is that God's ways of working with you are very normal and ordinary. God doesn't build the house by guiding your hand when you're hammering the nail to not hit your thumb. I've hit my thumb quite a bit. And I'm I'm not gonna blame God though, I'm gonna blame me. What we see here is God works with you in the ordinary things of life. So what does it mean? I've like talked really vague about living life with God. If I'd probably be frustrated if I was you right now, like what does that mean? Does that mean just do more quiet times? Not quite. This is how I would define doing life with God. And hopefully this is freeing and empowering for you. Doing life with God is doing ordinary things with God in mind. It's doing your ordinary life with God in mind. It's studying for that test with God in mind. It's working at your job with God in mind. It's coming to church with God in mind. Like that even needs to be said, but it does. It's talking to your spouse with God in mind. It's parenting with God in mind. And there's specifically three things that I've already said that you need to have in your mind as you live your ordinary life, which what we say here is your ordinary life becomes extraordinary when you live life with Jesus. Guys, we're not all called to just be celebrities. We're not all called to be, have as much power positions and popularity as we can muster. We're called to live our normal, ordinary lives with God in mind and to remember these three things. I need God. I'm not God. I'm loved by God. I need God. I'm not God, I'm loved by God. I need God, I'm not God, I'm loved by God. Imagine how your life would change if you did your ordinary things with those three things in mind. It would change the way you speak to people, it would change the way you view people, it would change, honestly, probably your whole mood at times. When you see the, so I'm not telling anybody, quit your job, and go work at a church or go be a missionary. Sometimes people are called to do that, but sometimes, and oftentimes this is the case more often than not, God is calling you to work your boring, ordinary job for his glory, remembering him while you do it. You don't have to do something grand in the eyes of the world. What's grand in the eyes of God is changing a diaper with joy. I can be the best of grumblers when I'm changing a diaper. But doing that with joy, not thinking I'm above it, is finding meaning in life. Being filled with gratefulness and thankfulness when you're simply doing a project around the house because God has given you the skills and the ability to build that deck, 
to fix that window. Man, that is what gives meaning to our lives is when we do ordinary things with God in mind. It is life with God in all of life. So you don't have to sell your house. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to go AWOL. All you have to do is remember God. You know why? Because Jesus doesn't necessarily call everybody to do that, the, the same things. What he does call everybody to do is what? Come to me. Come to me, all who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And how about you exchange this bread of toil and this bread of burden for the bread of life? Because the bread of life is the one who gives meaning to the ordinary things that he's called you to do. Think about something as ordinary as parenting, how widespread it is to be a parent. It is so ordinary, yet it is so challenging. Hardest thing I've ever done by far. And my kids are only four years old, the oldest. And I know it probably gets harder. <laughs> That's encouraging. <laughs> Fills my heart with joy. There comes a point where you can't force your kids to do anything. And that's when you have to say, unless the Lord builds the house. Unless the Lord will build the house. I do it in vain. So don't coerce things to happen into your life, but remember God and remember him by reminding yourself, I'm not God. I need God. I'm loved by God. I'm not God. I need God. I'm loved by God. So here's the question that I want us to ask in closing. We think about the two activities we have to build and to protect I want to simply ask, for, this is for me too. Are you cultivating something with God in your life or are you just surviving? Are you cultivating something with God in your life or are you just surviving? Are you cultivating your relationships? Are you cultivating that schoolwork that God has called you to? Are you cultivating that job with him or are you just making it through the day? You can take your ordinary life that you live right now and infuse it with meaning and with rest when you live life with God. The yoke that Jesus calls us to is basically a non-yoke. A yoke was this bar that oxen would wear around their necks as they would pull a cart across the field. And Jesus says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Because the yoke that Jesus carries was to be with God the Father, to remember his presence, remember his plan, and to live life with him. I mean, how ordinary was Jesus when you really think about it? Of course, he was God's son. L let me not just gloss that over that. He was a poor carpenter in an unknown town who lived 30 years in obscurity, only to live three years in prominence to be betrayed and killed. And he did that so that he could call you 2,000 years later, come to me and, and carry the yoke that I carried, being okay with suffering, being okay with remembering God's presence and remembering his love, regardless of your circumstances. Why don't you bow your heads with me? I want you to think about that question. What am I, or am I cultivating life with God or am I just surviving? This is not a call to feel guilty. It's not a call to change every single plan you had for this year. This is a call to look at your normal life. Most of us live a pretty ordinary life. Nothing flashy. No news stories are getting written about us. There's no fame. It's kind of like the Isaiah 53 promise about Jesus. He had no, he had no beauty that we should look at him. Lots of us live life like that and that's okay because God didn't call you to a life of fame and power and popularity. Life called, God called you to a life of humble, worshipful work. 
work within your family, work within your relationships, work within your jobs. I'm going to pray with you and you can continue to reflect for a moment on what you're cultivating or if you're surviving and then you can stand and sing with us as we close. Father, I pray today that we don't see your burden as a one more thing to just pile on top of the resolutions that we already made. I pray we don't just feel guilty by the ways that we've forgotten you, but I pray that we would accept your words as they are when you call us to come to you, if we're heavy laden or burdened or anxious or toiling, and to lay those burdens down at your feet and to pick yours up, knowing that your burden is simply to live life with Jesus, to live life with God, to embrace your love, and to walk with you in faith. Let us be people who cultivate and not just survive. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access a discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove, what we're up to, and access even more resources. Thanks again for opening God's Word with us today. We hope that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with Him.